You can continue charging your devices, that's fine too. <laughs> Um, welcome. Uh, I am happy y'all are here. My name is Anna. I'm going to be talking about how we, and that is many more people than just me, have scaled uh, the community that's behind uh, the DBT open source project from a few hundred folks to now over 30,000. And this is a slightly polished version, a slightly more polished version of me. Um, I am the director of community at uh, DBT Labs, and um, I also run uh, the data function because uh, to us they're kind of closely uh, closely linked. And uh, a little about me and kind of why I'm up here. Um, communities are my universe. They're everything that um, makes up my life. I like to tell people the story that I met my husband at a Ruby meetup. So uh, communities are very special to me. Um, most of my friends um, I've met through some community or other, and I think it's just an incredible way to improve social mobility. Um, uh, communities offer opportunities that you won't be able to get anywhere else, and so I tend to apply that lens to everything I do. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to, to apply that lens to a community as, um, as large as the one behind DBT. Um, I've been a member of communities, studied communities, and scaled communities for about 15 years now, I wanna say. Um, all the way from like open source to, to data and everything in between. I uh, went to grad school because I wanted to, to learn how open source communities worked and, uh, and help them work better. Um, so uh, if you're ever interested about that, I can talk to you in the hallway track. Uh, but today I'm responsible for one of the largest and most active communities in the data analytics space, and that's the DBT community. So what we're gonna talk about today is I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background about what DBT is, because um, I think for most of the folks um, attending, uh, this isn't a project you might have uh, come across, but I promise you it's really big for the data analytics folks. <laughs> um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the growth trajectory that we were on so that you have some context about like what scale means for us. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a framework about how I think about communities. Um, I think they're three different kinds, um, and spoiler, they're, they're not actually uh, mutually exclusive. And then um, related to each one of those, we're gonna talk about how we've scaled awareness of communities, knowledge sharing in the community, contributions, and um, even culture for, for 30,000 folks. So this is DBT, this is DBT Core. Um, it's the uh, open source heart of uh, the DBT world, and it's basically a DevOps framework for data analysts. So um, analytics code is still code, no matter what language you write it in, SQL is code. So what DBT does is it helps provide a framework for analysts to work like modern software engineers. So think, think Rails, but for, for data people, right? Um, about 9,000 companies use the, the open source project in some form. Um, there are hundreds of forks, um, hundreds of community contributions by now. Uh, the project's about six years old. Um, it was, uh, first commit was March 2017, uh, 2016, and we just released 1.0 last December. So we have a high bar for 1.0. <laughs> um, and uh, this is the growth of our community um, along, uh, along this time. So the community has existed pretty much for as long as the open source project has because as soon as the open source project kind of landed out in the world, um, it transformed the way that folks on data teams work, much in the same way that Rails did, like um, in, in 2008 when it first appeared, right? Um, it really helped people develop more quickly and in a much more standardized way, and so DBT does the same thing. Um, and people got really excited about that because it's a really, really new thing um, for folks in the analytics space. And so um, you can see that um, right around 2020 is, uh, AV guy told me not to turn my head. You can see that right around 2020 um, is when stuff started to really take off. Um, and that's because uh, we started to build a uh, company around the project. So before it was just an open source project that was supported um, you know, on a like, you know, semi-official um, basis by um, a consulting company called Fishtown Analytics. And then we rebranded, we became DBT Labs, and um, we invested really heavily in developing uh, the open source, the open core 
part of DBT. And so we have like an entire um, core team uh, with an engineering manager, um, and we have a product manager who's responsible for this area. And um, so we have um, kind of a really interesting dynamic in terms of um, the development that we do and, and contributions. Um, and our growth is still doubling. So we've like doubled in the last year from like more than doubled from about 14,000 uh, to about 30,000 now in terms of like humans in the community, which is really cool. So looks like a, li like a literal hockey stick. So um, audience participation time. Uh, any guesses what those little bumps are on the graph? I don't know if you can see them. Yes. Uh, good guess, but no. Uh, one of those is, but it's also tied to a different event. Anything else? No? So we've actually been running a conference um, for the past two years, and um, it's at the end of the year. Um, we announced our 1.0 release um, at the user conference, and the bump in community growth is, um, is a result of people gathering and uh, talking to each other about this community. And um, every time we gather folks together, we see kind of like a step change increase in the rate of growth of the community, which is really cool. So before we get into like the meat of all of this, um, if there's only one thing that you take away from this talk, is really that you're never done building your community. Like it's, it's a living, breathing thing. Um, it's kind of like when you adopt a puppy, um, you kind of have to be with it throughout its entire life. So whether you have 50 people who are like, just like really getting started using um, the thing that you've built, or um, if it's 5,000, you're always thinking about how to make their experience the best one. And so it's really not about you. Okay, so I lied, it's two things, right? You're never done and it's not about you. Um, and so you're not thinking about like, how do I build a community to do X thing um, at, the, at the scale that we're talking about? You are more tending a garden and uh, you are encouraging and nudging things to work in a particular direction. You have very little control over the process at the scale that we're at. Um, and I like to think about communities as um, aligned in three buckets because I always like to ask why. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Um, uh, what is the problem you're trying to solve with your community? And um, those three buckets for me are uh, brand, contribution, and uh, community practice. So when I say brand, I'm not talking about like company brand. I'm talking about um, identity, right? So uh, the way that uh, Ubuntu is an identity, or in this case, um, I think folks in here would appreciate this. You know, um, the Arch community has a very strong identity, so much so that it spawned a meme. Like, people are really proud of the fact that they use Arch Linux, right? And so uh, it's like, oh, hi, by the way, I use Arch Linux as a meme. And um, you literally don't need to know anything else about that community. Uh, and it's, uh, it's funny, but it's also a really great awareness tool. Um, so that's brand. You've got... Contributions, which is kind of what people typically think about when they think about an open source community. It's like people contributing code, right? Maybe documentation, um, but you know, depending on the, the types of humans um, and the type of problem you're solving with your open source project, contribution can mean a bunch of other different things. So for example, uh, DBT solves a problem for data analysts. Um, they're not usually folks who are uh, writing Python every day in a production grade environment. So I expect less contributions um, in the form of code, but we get a ton of documentation contributions because we make it really easy for folks to do that and to help us. And that's especially important because um, DBT depends, it, it sits on top of a warehouse layer and there's many different kinds of warehouses that DBT works with and we can't keep up with documenting all of those relationships. And so we depend on the community to document how things work. Um, a lot of the time. Um, so uh, scaling your idea of what a contribution is. And then finally, a community of practice. And uh, this is where you go uh, into the space of forums, things like discourse, things like Slack. Um, and uh, a community of practice is really folks teaching each other how to do a thing. 
So um, if you take the example of Rails again that we've been talking about earlier, a uh, community of contributors would be folks who are you know, collaborating on code and documentation and things like that. But um, the community of practice around Rails uh, would be people teaching each other how to set up Rails for the first time, right? How to integrate it into their workflow, how to change the way that their teams work in order to adapt to this new framework, right? And so um, DBT has, uh, has a similar um, kind of a similar model. And uh, the thing that I've realized about communities is that it's really not any one of these things. It's kind of a portfolio. Like there's a, there's a proportion of each one of these things that's present in a community in different proportions. And so for us, it's more like 40% brand, 40% community of practice, and 20% uh, community of contributors, uh, mostly because we have like an entire team that um, has a roadmap and, and contributes uh, code, and because we don't expect our users to um, have the technical background to be able to contribute in, in the way that, um, that some projects might. So roughly, to me, this maps to three different areas of leverage that you have as you're growing your community. So um, as your community grows beyond a few hundred or like beyond tens or hundreds of people, um, the way that you think about awareness changes, and that's really related to you know, brand identity. Um, the way that you think about encouraging contributions changes, and the way that you think about knowledge transfer and encouraging people to, to help each other, um, uh, that changes a lot too. And so let, let's talk about awareness first. Um, this is really a question of do people know who you are? Do people know what you represent? How are you different? If in a small community you're thinking about, like, I just want to get people to use this thing, right? Like when you're first getting started, you're mostly thinking about, like, hey, come try this thing for the first time. Um, when you get to thousands of people, uh, the types of things that, um, the, the different ways that you get the word out about your community, about the open source project that you are supporting is going to be different. You can't, you can't go out and talk to thousands and thousands of people every month um, as a maintainer, as a, as a founder. So what do you do? So I have a handy meme. There's gonna be lots of memes in this presentation. Um, you know, so the, uh, the regular or maybe P-sized brain version of this is just you know making your project work right. That's the easy part. Um, I, I say this as a non-engineer. I'm sure it's not actually that easy. Um, and then you know um, it's getting it's about getting people to use the thing. That's like you know tens, hundreds scale. And then at the thousand scale, um, it's about getting people who are using the thing to tell other people to use the thing, right? And so. Um, if you have a community of a few hundred folks, it probably took you a lot of time to get to that point. You were probably spending most of your time um, reaching out and talking to folks. And so the next unlock for you is to scale yourself um, and uh, get other people to talk about this thing for you. And how we do this, like there's many different ways to do this, but how we do this is we invest heavily in the people in the community. So for example, uh, we coach people in, uh, how to write well. We coach people how to speak. Uh, we spend a lot of time helping folks refine talks and submissions to our conference, to all sorts of other things. Why? It's really good for folks' careers. Right? That's number one most important thing, like do things that help other people more than helping yourself. The second is that if there's compelled, um, really compelling writing or speaking that is by the community about their own work with DBT, that says so much more about the project and the community than if it was a bunch of advocates going out and like, here's a DBT demo, right? Um, it just, it, ha it carries much more weight. And there's a galaxy brain version of this. So if the, um, if uh, your motivation here is to get people to talk to other people about the thing, um, the galaxy brain version is, people who aren't using the thing telling other people about the thing, right? And so this is when you get so good at telling the story of like what your project is, what niche you fill, 
um, what makes you special, that folks are starting to talk to one another about it, even if they're not users yet. Is it possible? Heck yes, right? Um, there are lots of examples out here um, on the floor. Uh, I don't use streaming data, but I hear folks who do uh, use streaming data that materialize as popular. That comes up a lot in the DBT community, for example. For folks here, I mean, I don't use Ubuntu or Linux Mint, but it's probably the best first Linux distro for someone to try desktop Linux, right? Like, almost everyone will recommend Ubuntu as the first thing to try, or at least they did in, in my time. I don't know if that's still true now. Um, but they don't necessarily have to be Ubuntu users themselves. They just know that it's good for beginners, right? And that is awareness um, that is like galaxy brain level awareness, right? And then the other thing is, the way that we think about swag changes um, at the scale that we're at. So, you know, everyone makes stickers. Um, you've got bottles galore. How many bottles and bags and stickers and t-shirts have you gotten today, right? It's like, it's kind of ridiculous. I have like an entire closet of tech t-shirts. So um, that's no longer fun and interesting, but uh, the way that we think about swag is a little bit more of an identity statement. So um, think about that, uh, that distillation of the brand of your community, like what do you stand for? And design your swag around that. So uh, maybe the platform that you have is one um, centered around pride. Maybe it's um, the environment. So I'll give you an example. Uh, for um, probably the women in the room, who here owns a pair of Rothy's? Uh-huh, okay, okay. Okay, keep your hands up. So of the folks who have uh, a pair of Rothy's, how many, folk, how many of you have talked to someone else you didn't know because of your pair of Rothy's, because you were wearing them or they were wearing it? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, why is that? What, what, what's, what's the big deal about Rothy's? They are recycled plastic, yes. Um, so Rothy's have a really compelling narrative. They're shoes. Okay, for folks who are like, what the hell were we talking about? They're shoes, oh, yeah. all right? Um, they are really comfortable women's shoes. And this is like, comfortable women's shoes are like pockets. It's just like, it, that's already a selling point in and of itself, right? So they're comfortable, number one. Number two, they're washable. And number three, they're good for the planet. Um, and so that's it, like that's the narrative. And it is so compelling and powerful for, um, uh, for folks that the brand just like, spreads like wildfire. Um, I think someone had, no? Yeah, we've got, a, we've got a moderator with a mic so that folks on the, yeah, feel free to jump in. Like we're, we're, a, we're a small crowd. Coming up the elevator, uh, not two minutes before <laughs> coming in here, we had a very lengthy discussion about pockets for pockets. women's yeah. clothing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I'm, I'm still waiting for the brand that is going to build a platform around pockets. Um, so if, you, if you're looking for a business opportunity, there you go. But like, that's, that's, what to me, uh, that's what swag is to me at the level of like a really large community is like you're making a statement. And so in this case, like Rothy's isn't swag, it's the product. But the product itself is making a statement, right? It's, it's making a statement about the environment. It's making a statement about like um, uh, women's comfort uh, and, and uh, reusability and, and things like that. So that's really cool. So I encourage folks to, to think about that. But the, the fact that she didn't use the word she uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, exactly. Um, really good point in the front here um, that I'll repeat is uh, the fact that no one mentioned the word shoes um, in like the first several minutes of the conversation is just a testament to like how powerful that that identity is. Um, so so that's brand and awareness. Okay, let's talk about knowledge sharing. This is related to um, building a community of practice. And the, the reason it's second on my list is because for, for DBT, those are like the two big things, right? Brand and awareness and uh, community of practice. So a community of practice, just to remind us, is when um, folks are getting together in a community to teach each other how to do a thing. Um, they are learning something new for the first time or uh, they are refining their skills. And so, um, in the case of uh, the DBT community, what that looks like is we have folks who are data team leaders who get together and talk about how org structure changes when you adopt 
um, software engineering best practices? Like, what does that mean for job titles? What does that mean for uh, folks' career progression? How do you evaluate folks? Like, all of those things. How do you advocate for these changes in your organization, right? Um, how do you, uh, what are best practices for working with data in this new space? Like, those are the kind of conversations um, that, that the community uh, enables. And so that, that is what knowledge sharing means to us. The problem is, how do you do this in a group of 30,000 people? Right? It's, it's sort of like standing up in a room and, and, and yelling um, when like, uh, everyone's gathered for a keynote at a conference like this one. Right? It's a lot of people. So um, this is where uh, it starts to get really interesting. Um, who has heard of Dunbar's number here? Yeah, OK. Uh, at the, at the risk of uh, putting more steps on our moderator's uh, uh, Apple Watch, maybe can have someone tell us what Dunbar's number is. Um, it's basically like the amount of personal relationships that someone can maintain. And mm -hmm. if new people come in, somebody else drops out. So it's yeah. like that, basically yeah. the average. Which exactly. seems kind of high, actually. 150? Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a yeah. lot of people. Like just maintaining relationships with like 10 is hard. <laughs> yeah, so if you think about it in the context of like an organization or like a company that you're a part of, 150 is when it starts to become harder to remember everyone's names and what they do. Like even if you like interact with people all the time, by the time you get to 300, you're like, I know we've met, but. Um, and so Dunbar's number gets really important. So if Dunbar's number is 150 and you have 30,000 people in your community, what do you do, right? Um, uh, this is where, um, uh, we do something called micro communities. So we start thinking about different pockets of people who are much smaller, who have something in common, ideally within that number. Um, so for example, um, we have a community of DBT users in San Francisco, in San Diego, in Austin, in New York, in you know what have you. We have um, a community of folks who are data leaders and they have that thing in common with them. We have a community of folks um, who are working in a particular industry, the folks who are solving problems in the healthcare, in finance with DBT, right? Like um, in the public sector. And so uh, it's about kind of breaking things down into different segments and starting to, to think about um, what are the unique things that connect people beyond the fact that they're all a part of this community already. Um, and uh, a primary way we do that is when someone, say, posts an introduction, they say hi in the like, community Slack, we're like, great, you said that you work for you know, so-and-so company, um, maybe it's in healthcare, there's an entire channel here. You said you're from the Bay Area, cool, great, there's a meetup happening. And um, kind of helping people find those connections um, to someone uh, within kind of this like, smaller subset of the community is a really great way of bringing people in and like keeping them engaged. Um, and it encourages people to, to share more freely because it's a lot easier to talk to a group of 150 people than it is to a group of 30,000. Uh, Make sense? Um, and then the other problem you start to run into is platforms. Um, some platforms just don't scale. Um, to the size of like 30,000 people. And so um, uh, I, I talk about this as minding the back scroll, and I'll give you a very specific example. So um, Slack tends to be the thing that lots of communities use, or you know, Dis Discord, what have you, like some chat, IRC, um, some chat affordance uh, that um, enables folks to get together, talk to each other in real time, answer questions, right? Get like immediate feedback when they're like stuck on something extremely valuable when you have a few hundred people. At 30,000 people, it's nuts. So this is what it looks like for us on a given day. These two posts are in the beginner channel. They are seven minutes apart. There have been about six that say morning already, and it's not even 9.30, right? And so imagine if you're um, the person who is helping other people in the community. You're really motivated. You're like, I want to help beginners get started. If you're not living in this channel 24-7, you're going to miss questions. And people are going to feel like they're just like shouting out into the void. So like, sad face, 
right? It's um, the, the back scroll problem is like a really significant one and, and Slack no longer has the affordance um, of supporting that particular community use case at, at a certain scale. Um, so what do you do instead? Here's what we're doing. And I can't say that this is the best way, but this is what, we are, um, what we're trying right now. Um, this is, this is kind of like Reddit and Stack Overflow, but less, um, uh, fewer trolls is, is the way that I would put it. So um, GitHub discussions uh, is what we've landed on. And um, there's a few things that I love about this that Slack doesn't, doesn't do. The first is um, it, it's easier to search things. People ask the same questions over and over again. At a certain point, um, you just want to give, you know, you start sending out links. This way, people find the most common thing themselves. Um, you can also pretty easily help people navigate to like what is actually the thing that they're trying to do. Do you need help? Um, are you uh, trying to figure out how to do something for the first time? Um, and uh, the the really cool thing is um, we're gonna be able to take this and we're gonna be able to put it together with our documentation website, okay? And so then you have kind of this entire portal where all of your content lives. We can pull out the discussions that are answered, that are like gold standard, that are the most upvoted, we can curate, we can do all sorts of things. Um, and it creates like a lot of that flexibility. So um, this has been a really big unlock for us and like a really big part of our strategy this year to keep up with the growing community. Um, yeah, and many like happy face instead of crying face. Um, I uh, hopefully will report back as we continue to implement this, but this is the solution that, that we've adopted um, so far. And uh, it, so far it works really well. Um, it's really easy for folks to navigate and um, has pretty good SEO, which is really important. Yeah. I just have a quick question. So mm -hmm. as the community is growing and like all these questions are coming in, yep. do you um, create like strategy more to get like your community members to answer the questions or do you guys actually like hire more internal staff like over? The goal is for this to be um, a flywheel that the community supports itself. Like that's, that's the goal of um, knowledge sharing at the scale of 30,000 people. Like it, you can't keep up with all of the questions. Um, someone was telling me um, in, in like a related, uh, um, related company, they have like 8,000 questions a day on Stack Overflow. Like that's insane. Only the community can answer that, right? Um, so beyond a certain scale, you, you really do need to lean on folks. And the thing that you, you focus on is making it as easy as possible for them to help you. And so that's what the next part of the talk is going to be. Like, how do you scale contributions? Yes. Uh, so are you still using Slack or are you? We are, relying? yeah. OK. Yeah. See. So those micro communities still live on Slack, yeah, because um, Dunbar's number. But um, for questions, for things that we think are longer living, um, we're moving them to discussions. And it allows us to do cool things, like um, someone starts a discussion, and we don't really know, is it a question about getting started with the project? Is it a bug, or is it a feature? You kind of don't know until several comments in. Like, you know, you, you tend to um, engage in a conversation with someone, and then you realize, like, oh, actually, this is like a bug, or like, this is a gap in how we document the thing that we're doing, right? There's an assumption missing here. And so what we then do with that discussion is we, transfer it to an issue in the right repo. And um, we link a pull request when it's, uh, when it's been done. And everyone on that thread gets notified that like, okay, cool, we now have like a, a blog post about this, or this is like part of the next release or something. And so that creates like a really nice, easy uh, transparency loop without having to do a lot of additional overhead. Yeah. So let's talk about scaling contributions. Um, and this is, this is us getting uh, close to the end here already. So um, we just talked about how it's important to help people help you at scale. Like you really can't, um, in a small community, maybe you have the opportunity to like handhold people when they're first getting started with contributions. You actually want to, you want to get to know the one person who's like, can I open a pull request against your, your project? Um, the first few times that happens, you're like, oh my God, that's so cool. Um, the hundredth time that happens, you're like, okay, I need 
resources, I need materials. So of course you need contributor guidelines, you need uh, good documentation, um, but there's a little bit more to it than that when you reach a certain scale. Like there's, those are kind of like table stakes, right? Um, so at this stage, when you are getting popular enough that you're kind of like batting contributions away, um, you want to start thinking about like, do you actually want contributions? Like that's, that's not a given for every open source project. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, you, you probably have a roadmap. You probably have an idea of what you're building over the course of like the next uh, six to 12 months. So you do want contributions, but really specific kinds. And you probably don't want um, a throwaway feature edition. You probably want to make sure that people are collaborating with you. So um, you, you're more likely to prioritize one repeat contributor over like 10 drive by PRs. It's much more valuable to you to like coach and mentor someone to be there with you to work with you consistently on a release than it is to um, to have like a bunch of people close bugs for you. Um, which isn't to say that the bug uh, closing is not important, but like your, your priorities tend to change. Um, and again, it depends on uh, who is uh, supporting your open source project, right? Do you have an engineering team behind that that is funded? Is it purely volunteers like those dynamics? Um, those dynamics differ. And I'd be interested to hear how some folks solve this problem. But for us, uh, because we have an engineering team um, and we have a roadmap, we have a product manager, we want to be really clear with the kinds of contributions that we're looking for and the kinds of things that we think are really valuable for folks to spend time on. And so here's how we do that. Again, GitHub discussions, but this time it's on our um, core repo, not our documentation repo. So uh, you can see, and I don't know if this is big enough, but uh, there's a few things going on here. We have uh, the top discussion here is an upcoming feature. So we're kind of signaling to the community, like this is what we're working on, this is how we plan to approach the problem, uh, just like we would expect someone in the community to do before they open up a pull request to like, you know, jump in and talk about it. So we apply the same standard to ourselves. And then um, you can also see in this example, the number one most requested feature from the community is, is above the fold. Like it's visible to everyone because it's like so highly upvoted. It's actually the last one on this list, column level lineage. It's a really hard problem to solve as it turns out. And so we get questions about it all the time, but we know we're not going to be able to get to it for a while. And it's not something that you can just hack in an afternoon. So we have a discussion about like, why is this a hard problem? And we make it visible. And um, we point folks to it, as opposed to every once in a while you have an AMA, or every once in a while you're in Slack, and someone's like, when are you doing column level lineage? And we're like, here's a discussion, right? And like, if you want to stay up to date, subscribe to the discussion. If you want to contribute, if you want to work with us on making this a reality, let's talk. Um, so that, that kind of signaling is, is super important. And when you give people affordances like this, when you make it easy to discover information, what you'll find is that the community will start jumping in and addressing those questions for you, right? So now, anytime Python comes up in the context of DBT, people are like, oh, there's a thread. Just go and look at it, right? Anytime column level lineage comes up, not only DBT Labs folks, but the entire community is like, there's a thread. Like, just go to this, this thread and everything is there. And it is really, really powerful. So the thing about getting people to help you is you need to make it really, really easy for them to do that, right? Have things be really well organized, well curated, um, help people navigate stuff. So like, really think about platforms and affordances. I can't say that GitHub discussions is the best thing for everyone. Like, we've, we've thought a lot about why this is the best thing for us. Um, almost everyone who works with DBT already has a GitHub account. Like you need version control in order to make use of the tool. So this is really easy for us to do. Like it's, it, there's very, uh, a very low barrier to entry compared to say Stack Overflow, you have to sign up for an account, right? But that might not be true for your community. All right, and last but not least, how do you scale culture? Right, I, I mentioned for folks at the, uh, at the beginning, and if you missed it, um, I like to tell people that I, I met my significant other at a Ruby meetup. And Ruby meetups are kind of famous for their um, warm and welcoming culture, uh, the Ruby community in general. But how do you scale that to like, 
again, tens of thousands of people. DBT as a community is also really famous for that. It's, it's famous as a really welcoming place, as a really inclusive place, and that's really important because analytics is a field that has uh, representation from so many different backgrounds and so many different kinds of um, folks' experiences. And uh, for a lot of folks, software engineering best practices, things like Git, working in the command line, um, those are things they're encountering for the first time. It's really important that we create a safe environment. It's really important that we create an inclusive environment that we're talking about and making sure that things are, um, that folks feel welcome, seen, safe. And so when you're a small community, like yes, you need a code of conduct and enforcement policy, no matter how small or how large a community you have. Yes, you need to remind folks about your rules all the time. In a small community, it's easy to remind folks about rules and be prescriptive. Um, but in a large community, you can't be everywhere. You can't moderate everything all at once. And so it becomes really important to have the community step in and moderate for you, right? Um, just like it is with, uh, with content. And it's equally important to focus on what people actually do. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, again, this might be too small, but uh, this is our introductions channel in Slack. And um, for folks who are a little closer to the front, I don't know if I can zoom in, um, do you observe anything about the way that people write their introductions? How would you write your own introduction knowing nothing else about this community? And I'm gonna try and zoom in. Name, title, com company? Yeah, oh. exactly. Name, title, company. <laughs> yeah, there's like a formula here that's really, um, that's really easy to observe. It's like, hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm a insert title here and I work at blah company and maybe I live in this area. And, uh, and that's it. And like everyone has kind of the same, the same pattern. And you will see that uh, when people reply, they will also use kind of a similar pattern to be like, hi, welcome, we're so glad you're here. Um, and uh, the, the reason that this works so, like we didn't tell people to do this, but um, the formula exists because people see other people do it. It's really easy to observe certain behaviors like that, but the same is true of behaviors that you don't want, right? And so if you are not that good at enforcing certain, um, certain rules and certain behaviors, uh, it can really quickly turn into a situation where you have um, bad examples that people are recreating because they see other people do it. So it's really important to keep, keep in mind um, what people see other people do. It can be sometimes more visible than the rules that you have, no matter how many times you put the rules in front of people. Um, it, it's really easy to, uh, to lose your way. So um, that's why you have to scale moderation. You have to empower folks to tell you. Um, you have to make your uh, rules and expectations as easy as possible to follow so that other people in the community, just like they know where the Python thread is and just like they know um, where the column level lineage conversation is, they know that like, hey, we use threads here. Like, please, uh, please don't double post, right? Uh, please, uh, we have a Slack bot that says, don't say guys, right? Like just, you know, little things like that um, are easy for folks to repeat and they help a ton in keeping this like a really easy to navigate and a safe and inclusive space. So um, that's actually it. That's all I got for you. Um, but thank you for, oh, thank you. Thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the great audience participation. I appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm around hallway track if folks have questions. Um, I know we're just about up at time. I don't know if we have time for one question. Do we? OK. Oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Um, that, this was really great. Um, and the, um, well, let me just ask my question because we're short on time. But thank you for your presentation. The, going back to the community of practice yeah. and brand and stuff, um, for, I don't know, a long time, decade and a half, um, myself and other folks have been describing open source communities as communities of practice mm -hmm. stop. And then you just blew my mind with that other perspective. So um, I, I, my first instinct is to try to, is to say, well, yes, branding and identities and all these things are part of the practice and people do, anyway, to try to refold it. But I'm just curious if you have any other thoughts or things on how 
you identify those? Or do you see any Venn diagrams in them? Or are they parts mm -hmm. of a whole? Is there something that is that they are inclusive of all three of those? Yeah, Thank it's you. a good question. Um, there's definitely a Venn diagram. Like I mentioned at the beginning that for us it's like 40, 40, 20, or like 40, 20, 40 in, in, um, in terms of just like how much time people spend in those buckets. So it's probably all of those things, but the weight each one will have might be different depending on what you're trying to do. And so um, one of the really cool things about the DBT community is that the practice of what we call analytics engineering, like analytics engineering is the act of um, applying these software engineering best practices to analytics workflows. It's synonymous and interchangeable with uh, DBT the project, and that's really cool. But that's, that's where like branding and awareness um, uh, becomes really important. And so what the DBT brand stands for is really closely aligned with what the analytics engineering community stands for, right? And so we have to like um, think about that really carefully. So great question. Thank you. Hey. Thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging out.